One of the first items you'll see when entering the Warrens Haunted Museum is this terrifying little shadow doll made of bird feathers and real human teeth. The Warrens son-in-law and current proprietor of the now defunct museum, Tony Spera, offers a little bit of insight on the doll, saying it was originally acquired at an antique shop where it was being sold, with the owners of the shop being none the wiser of the doll's evil. That's completely on the antique shop owner though, you know, you come into a possession of a doll made of bird feathers and human teeth, your first instinct should not be to stick a price tag on it, you should toss it into the ocean or burn it, something like that. Sparrow claims that the doll's curse works by taking a photograph of the doll, and then when it develops, you write the curse that you'd like to inflict on the back of the photo, and you send that to your victim, and the person who opens the envelope and sees the doll in the photograph will invite the curse into your home. Now, probably a lot of pictures of the shadow doll behind me, or pictures of the shadow doll being interspersed in this video right now. I just want to tell you, I don't have any curses in mind. I didn't write any curses down. I don't have a negative thought inside my head. Buddy, I barely have thoughts inside my head as is. If I would curse you with anything, I would curse you to always find loose change, always get texts back from your crush, and I'd curse you to always make the right amount of pasta. I'd only curse you of good things. Now the real question I have to ask about this scary shadow doll is do you think it's jealous that it's not the most famous haunted doll in the Warrens Museum? I know I would probably have a very hard time sitting next to Annabelle all day. Everyone's coming to gawk and take photos at my movie star sister. Ugh, hard life. Nobody's gonna make any movies about me. No wonder that doll is cursing people. And if you're looking for more stories about cursed dolls, I've got lots and lots and lots and lots of those. But I've got lots of other scary things too. Aliens, ghouls, goblins, conspiracies, just about anything you can think up. I've done a video or two on it. So hit subscribe. Please make sure you hit that little bell as well. That means you get every one of the videos we make. But do that at the end of this video if you wouldn't mind. Because I got four more crazy cursed objects coming up for you right about now. Number four, cursed ballista balls. Like the last couple years had everybody acting pretty, pretty strange. I think it was unprecedented times. Maybe you binged all of Tiger King in a day. Maybe you got really into making sourdough. Maybe you returned a cursed artifact you stole when you were a teenager. We all went through some personal development. In 2020, a source that chooses to remain anonymous returned an ancient artifact that they'd stolen as a teenager to the Israeli government a Bronze Age ballista ball fired during the Great Jewish Revolt by the Romans. The thief swiped them as a teenager when visiting with a group of friends and went on to live a fairly normal life, a successful career, found a partner, sired some children. Throughout his entire life, he felt as if there was a weight over him, as if he had some invisible presence of guilt weighing down on him forever. And he said no matter how long it had been, or how much his life had moved past this childhood act of delinquency, his heart could never move on from it, and he felt as if he'd been cursed to forever bear the guilt of it. During the events of the last few years, he said it stirred in him this apocalyptic feeling that made him want to return the ballista balls in the hopes of finally clearing his conscience. Do you think at any point during all that, during all that fun stuff during the quarantine and everything, do you, do you think he was ever worried that he might have accidentally done it by moving those ballista balls and that's why he had to put them back? Through Facebook, he ended up getting put towards the right channels within the government to return it. But you know what's really bizarre about this bizarre story? This isn't even the first time this has happened, because in 2015 an almost identical story played out. In 2015, two ballista balls were returned to Israeli authorities alongside a note stating, I took these in 1995 from a residential quarter at the foot of the summit. They have brought me nothing but trouble. Please do not steal antiquities. Well, I've got to say it's a nice change of pace to hear about people trying to undo a curse before anything got too heated. And you know what? I like these stories. It's a very easy to follow message for those of us listening at home. Don't steal antiquities. Unless you're Indiana Jones, that should be some pretty easy advice to follow in your life. Number three, the crying boy painting. Some of my favorite cursed objects are a good haunted painting. Maybe it's because I had a huge fondness for Ghostbusters 2 as a little guy and it's got a haunted painting as the main bad guy of that movie. Maybe it's just because I'm very enticed by the uncanny valley of a pair of eyes that you can look at but can never look at you back. We'll probably uh, mention that in therapy next time. Anyway, case in point, take a look at this painting, the crying 
Dying Boy. Looks like a fairly normal painting, wouldn't look too out of place in your dentist's office. It's not really my kind of art, but I'm sure a generation of grannies love to put this in the parlor. It's been the center of a series of strange coincidences that are just too darn odd to be true. It was painted by an Italian painter, one Giovanni Bragolin, and mass produced as a print across the 50s so everyone could enjoy this sad crying boy in the comfort of their own home until they would burn down. Because for some bizarre, possibly paranormal reason, firefighters around Essex, London would report that frequently, amidst smoldering ruins of a burned down house, repeatedly they would find the crying boy painting completely untouched by the flames even when everything else had burned to ash. Now, this happens once, that's bizarre. Two, very strange. If this happens three times, you've got yourself an outright paranormal mystery on your hands. The British tabloid The Sun loved the story and was spreading stories of the cursed paintings like a house on fire. Too soon? The Sun printed out warnings of people who owned the painting and that they should get rid of it, lest they find themselves smelling smoke. The story was so popular and people were so invested in the curse of the crying boy that The Sun tried to take it upon themselves to rid London of the curse by, get this, holding a bonfire in which anyone who owned a print of the cursed painting could come, torch it, and hopefully exercise whatever demons had got into the printing press. The bonfire was a raging success, with sackfuls of the prints being torched, seemingly ending the curse of the crying boy. After hearing about this story, though, does anyone else kind of want one of the prints? I don't know. There's just, there's something about it. Number two, the Hope Diamond. The Hope Diamond has shown up more than a few times on this channel, and for good reason. It's considered one of the most haunted rocks on the planet. The diamond was first uncovered in India, with reports purporting that the diamond was plucked from the eye of a statue of the goddess Sita, the goddess of beauty and devotion. Legend has it that the first person who stole the diamond was mauled by dogs shortly after taking it. That's a pretty quick curse. From here, the diamonds passed through countless hands, never staying in one place for too long. It's said to have been owned by King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, who as far as I know, never had anything too bad happen to her. Nothing worth losing your head over worrying about. That's a little, uh, little history joke for you. Throughout the diamond's storied history, it's been said that just about every owner suffered a horrific fate. 14 confirmed deaths and owners throughout history, and that's only the ones we know of for sure, as there could be countless more. The jeweler who recut the stone into its current form, William Falls, died a ruined man in poverty and hardship. His son Hendrik stole the stone from his father, who would later be prompted to take his own life for the crime. After passing from owner to owner under grisly circumstances, it made its way to Harry Winston, an American jeweler who possibly making the only good choice of anyone on this list, thought it better to play with his odds and donated the diamond to the Smithsonian Museum in 1958, where it currently resides sealed away. The curators of the Smithsonian were thrilled to receive it and have said that they consider the gem a crown jewel and that in all the time it's been in their watch, no one has suffered any ill effects. Maybe Indiana Jones was right. It belongs in a museum. That's, that's too many Indiana jokes in one video. Too many Indiana jokes. I'm just, I'm excited about the new one. I can't believe old Harrison Ford's coming back again for the millionth time. He's always coming back. Number one, Robert the Doll. Every good list of cursed objects should definitely include one cursed doll. I know we had the shadow doll up there, but that was like a starter curse doll. We got better ones. So that's why we're going to finish up this list for today with a classic haunted doll. Dolls are just inherently a little bit scary when they're not being used for make believe. And they're especially scary when they carry a series of unfortunate urban legends with them, like the case of Robert the doll. Maybe you've even heard of Robert the doll, maybe from this very own channel, maybe from this very own host, because I mentioned him in the first video that I ever did. It's all full circle. He's one of the more notable cursed dolls out out there. If you're in the cursed doll community, you probably know him. Robert has been haunting for over a century. He used to be the property of one Robert Jean Otto, although he shared a name with the doll he preferred to be called Otto. Maybe because of the doll he wanted to be called Otto. Anyway, Otto received Robert as a boy from his grandfather who obtained the doll through unknown means. Trying to trace wherever it came from has proven fruitless as no toy company has ever been found to have produced it. Now the young Otto loved Robert and had a very active imagination to a degree that would unsettle his parents. Parents. He would refer to the doll in first person and brought it everywhere with him, even dressed it in his own clothing. Otto would say that he would hear Robert talk to him and would see him move. 
Children who passed the homestead when walking by would say that they claim that they saw Robert in the windows watching them. Otto would blame all these mishaps on Robert. Injuries, breaks, anything that happened, it was because Robert had told him to do it or that Robert the doll had done it. And this behavior kind of understandably deeply worried Otto's parents. Otto kept Robert until the day of his death in 1974, where he then traveled from home to home, causing a path of misfortune wherever he went until he eventually found himself in the Key West Art and Historical Society, where he's now kept under very tight lock and key and has become the museum's most popular attraction, where visitors leave him offerings, treats, and even writing letters asking for protection or for him to curse others. Employees of the museum say sometimes they feel uncomfortable around him and have noticed a chill in the air by his seat or electrical malfunctions near where he sits. It's been said that they need to stay on his good side lest they provoke his wrath. Maybe it's a good thing then that he's locked up tight in that glass case and there's just something about this guy. And Robert, Robert the doll, if you're watching right now, just want you to know all that stuff I was saying, I was just playing. You know we're friends. You know we've always gone together, you and I. You know I'm a big fan of the scary doll community. I just wanted to make it clear, we're cool. Number five, the Knife Blade Man. Discovered in 2018 in Northern Italy, a group of archeologists were digging up a massive grave site of the Lombardo, an ancient Germanic people. Found in a necropolis, which is a very fancy word for a large, elaborate tomb, and maybe one of the best words in the English language, the team found hundreds of skeletons that were at the site, including horses and greyhounds, and for the most part, you know, they're not particularly notable. You've seen one old bag of bones, you've seen them all, except for one skeleton that in the place of a forearm was an impressive blade. Now this raises countless fascinating questions. Who was this guy? Was this the first Assassin's Creed protagonist? Some legendary madman of a warrior who lost an arm and thought, I don't know, put a blade on there, I can still fight. Well, the Lombardo people placed a great emphasis on war and combat in their culture, so it is possible. The researchers noted that there was a clear dated buckle around his arm, and pressure on the bones of his arm showed that it was an intentional prosthetic, right down to the wear and tear on his teeth, suggesting he tightened the straps for his head and blade with his teeth. Most of the other skeletons found in the necropolis all had blades buried with them at their sides, perhaps ritually out of honor, but this unique specimen had it grafted onto his arm like he's history's first cyborg or Baraka from Mortal Kombat. To be able to not only survive an amputation, pre-antibiotics and modern medicine is already impressive. And hey, if you're always looking to learn something from knife arm skeletons, then toss a subscribe our way. Top 5 Scaries always got a couple scary videos for you every day. Let's creep on creeping on. Number 4. The Hanging Coffins. We're going up to China for our next one, specifically Hubei, China. There's a cave there that the locals call the Cave of the Fairies, and you've probably already realized that there's going to be a dark secret involved with the Cave of Fairies. We never talk about anything nice here. It was said that the mythical creatures were supposed to live in the cave, but those who explored it inside found that there wasn't much of anything living at all, instead finding something deeply disturbing. Rows and rows of coffins, some hanging from ropes, some jammed, wedged between the rocks of the cave. The coffins themselves were massive, weighing around 200 pounds each, and some destroyed and ravaged. Dating the coffins puts them at around 1200 years old, and are thought to have been put up by the ancient Bo people, an extinct culture hailing from China, famous for this unique practice of hanging coffins from caves. It's thought that this served two purposes. One, as a ritualistic offering meant to bless the dead, and two, from a practical, pragmatic sense it would prevent any would-be carrion eaters from picking through to get a meal. Fascinatingly, it can be seen that all of the coffins were carved from a single tree, one big, big log. One wonders if that was part of the ritual element of it. Now, The coffins being smashed is interesting, because the discoverers of the coffins theorized that the damage was actually pretty recent, dating it to the 1960s, and their prevailing theory was that someone wandered into this cave in a place of desperation and smashed the coffins to garner some firewood in the hopes that they could survive the night and not pass among the hanging dead. Let's just hope they didn't release any ancient curses at the same time. Number 3. The Black Sarcophagus Now you might have heard of this one before. If you were on Twitter much a couple years ago, maybe you remember vaguely hearing about sarcophagus juice. Maybe those words are ringing a strange bell. There was a pretty good petition going around to let people drink the sarcophagus juice. But boo, let's back up a bit. What is sarcophagus juice and where did it come from and why do we want to drink it? Well I've got the answers. Somewhat. I've got some answers. In 2018, a team of archaeologists digging in Alexandria, Egypt, discovered a massive granite black sarcophagus, which immediately set off everybody's warning signs.
signs that you should not touch that. People wondered what the 30 ton stone slab could be containing, with some even suggesting it could have been the mighty body of Alexander the Great. People warned the archaeologists that there, you know, could be some ancient evil, like when King Tut's tomb was raided and a very strange curse befell the explorers and excavators. Well, what they found wasn't a hidden curse, but honestly, something stranger. Three skeletons inside the coffin with a skull shattered by an arrow and a whole lot of mysterious black goop or sarcophagus juice. So again, looping right back around it, what is the sarcophagus juice and does it taste good? Well, scientists analyzed the sludge and discovered that it was made from a combination of animal fats, tree resin, beeswax, and crude oil. The sludge has been recovered out of multiple coffins and sarcophagi, so it's not exclusive to this dreaded one. But that doesn't explain why this nasty stuff is there. Well, there's some theories about this, no concrete answers, but I'll do my best. It's said that when someone died, they become a form of the god Osiris, who is associated with death and rebirth. Osiris was called the Black One, and is depicted with very dark black skin in the guise of a mummified body. As well, black is also a color associated with the deposits on the bank of the River Nile after a flood season. Fresh and fertile soil was seen as inherently regenerative. So it's theorized that with the linking concepts of Osiris and the regeneration of the soil, soaking and filling the coffins with this black sludge was a very confusing part of the mummification process. Number two, headless Vikings. In 2008, a group of archaeologists were doing some fairly routine work in Dorset, a seaside town in England, in a rather dull job to improve local roads around the area. As could be expected, not too much of note was discovered, except for the mass grave of 54 headless Viking mercenaries. And not just were their skulls missing, but the rib cages, arms, and leg bones were all arranged neatly, surrounded by discarded teeth. No cloves or weaponry was discovered. So what happened? <laughs> because nothing my imagination is coming up with is conjuring anything good. Well, the bones revealed some fascinating finds, and I'll warn you now, by Odin's beard, they're all terrifying options. The teeth surrounding the grave were all filed down, but done neatly as if a craftsman had done it. Obviously, pre-Novocaine dental surgery wouldn't go down easy, so the process must have been excruciating, suggesting perhaps these men had had it done to them out of some sort of punishment, or they did it to themselves to frighten their opponents and show them just how strong they were. Neither one of those options is particularly pleasant to consider. But now let's get spine chilling with it. The archaeologists prevailing theory about what happened to this big Nordic pile of bones is that looking at the wound patterns on the ribs and the torso bones were smart, surgical, precise blows, not matching with a rabid hack job you'd expect from a bra. The archaeologists suggested that the Vikings weren't slain in battle, but rather offered up perhaps perhaps to some sort of strange, sadistic ritual, or perhaps a mass execution. It would explain why the men had no gear with them as well. The large number of bodies and intense cruelty of it suggests that there wasn't any trained executioners, leading to the prevailing theory that it's a dark, dark ritual. Number 1. Bog People Name one good thing that's ever been found in a bog. Need some help? There's never been one. For peat farmers in Northern Europe, it's a thankless life, working in wet, muddy bogs and occasionally finding leathery preserved bog mummies. Due to the low temperatures, lack of oxygen, and high acidity of bogs, bodies found there are preserved disturbingly well. Well, preserved is a bit of a misnomer, they're twisted and rived, but they're intact sort of. It's hard to think of these as preserved well because they look like the scariest things you've ever seen, but the process is weirdly fascinating if you're interested in looking up something disgusting. This happens all over North Western Europe, with no one specific case to point to. It happens all over Ireland, Germany, Great Britain, the Netherlands, and so on. The bodies range from anywhere as old as 8,000 years old, preserved, to the most recent appearing to have been from the early turn of our century. Now, no one really has any idea how many of these bog bodies could be out there, and no one really knows how the unfortunate bog victims ended up in their final muddy resting spot. Some of them could possibly have just been unlucky souls who found themselves lost and fell in. But another prevailing theory is that Roman Iron Age people in Northern Europe sacrificed people to the bogs, which sounds too dark to be real, but apparently is. They would also offer people as sacrifice or as punishment for their perceived social imperfections, which may I just say I am very glad this practice isn't commonplace because I would be cast into the bogs faster than you could say peat deposit. Number five, Karamikos. Coming up first is going to be a tomb from ancient Greece. Beautiful place, beautiful tombs. Karamikos is a beautiful neighborhood in Greece. It was the pottery center of Greece, if you can believe that, which would be interesting enough to print on a travel brochure, but it's also home to a cemetery that's existed since the Bronze Age. So that's some seriously old bones. Now, old bones aren't necessarily scary, but in 2020, when archaeologists discovered 30 stone tablets buried beneath a well, 
each engraved with curses crying out for help from the gods of the underworld. Now maybe that's a bit cursed. The Greeks would bury curses or requests, hoping the gods would hear them and grant them favor. Personally though, word to the wise, take it from Kratos or Zagreus, never make a deal with any of the gods of Olympus. It is simply just not worth it. Apparently this sort of thing, that is, you know, the practice of chucking cursed tablets into the graves of your dead, was not actually that uncommon in ancient Greece. Curses enshrined on tablets made from lead, wax and stone were fairly common in Greece where religion, magic and science all kind of blended together into one beautiful blurred line as the answers to a lot of life's questions. Oftentimes these cursed tablets were used to restrict rivals, place a curse on someone you didn't like much or if you had a court case and you didn't want someone to speak up you could always curse them out of testifying. I'm sure Saul Goodman would have loved that trick. Researchers believe that water was especially sacred to the ancient Greeks and that this discovery of 30 tablets in the well suggests that perhaps this was a case of someone trying to curse a whole community. It was thought too that wells were a route to the underworld and guarded by nymphs. So the scatterings of vessels and mugs found around the cursed tablets were thought to be gifts and offerings to the nymphs. Usually I just go for like a $15 Starbucks card in scenarios like that, especially if I don't really know the nymph that well. And my friends, if you're looking for more scary content, you don't need to go anywhere, you're in the right place. Stay subscribed for hundreds upon hundreds of scary videos, crypts, tombs, ghosts, aliens, cryptids, and more, oh my. Number four, the Alexandria Black Tomb. I'm not sure if anybody else remembers this one, but I certainly do. I remember seeing it on the news. It certainly got my attention, here we go. Back in July 2018, experts discovered a 2,000 year old sealed black granite sarcophagus in Alexandria, Egypt. Now, initially, yes, this is exciting, this is amazing, this is the find of Elijah. Lifetime. But it doesn't take long for speculation to then creep its way in. Do we open it? Do we not open it? What if it's something bad? What if it's a 2,000 year old ancient virus? Ah, do we do it? I don't know. We did it. Humans being as curious as we were, we just had to see what was inside. And inside, we did not find treasure. Rather, we found mummy juice. Just mummy juice. Inside were the remains of three Egyptian army officers accompanied by this reddish brown sewage liquid. It was disgusting. All the experts fleed the scene. It smelled so bad. This this is where that sarcophagus juice meme came from. This was the actual box. Mustafa Waziri, the Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, he declared that the mummies had decomposed in the tomb for thousands of years and that it resembled a family burial. Yeah, family burial. How lovely is that? Nice discount on that one. There were bones of three people in a puddle of sarcophagus juice. That is disgusting. That is not Alexander the Great. Definitely not. The coffin was found in a tomb in the city believed to be the final resting place of Alexander the Great. So you kind of have to open it at that point, right? This could literally be him. Or it could be mummy juice from 305 BC. One or the other. Do we like this? Do we like opening up ancient curses? Did anything happen here? Waziri ensured us immediately that he said that we've opened it and thank God the world has not fallen into darkness. Now I remind you, this was a year before the plague arrived, so. Number three, Qin Shi Huang. The tomb of former emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang, is notable for many, many reasons. Maybe it was because in 1974, when farmers from the Shaanxi province were digging a well, they discovered hundreds upon hundreds of terracotta soldiers, complete with horses, chariots, officers, infantry, and a whole court. They discovered one of the world's greatest archaeological wonders. Two thousand terracotta soldiers. Qin Shi Huang's tomb. The tomb was built like this basically to serve as history's most impressive flex. Qin Shi Huang wanted to make it good and clear that even in death, he held more might and imperial power than anyone could ever imagine. And he wanted his own army to take with him in the afterlife. They say you can't take it with you, but he did. What's wild is we don't even know how far this tomb goes since it still hasn't been fully uncovered. Those thousands of terracotta soldiers, those might just have been the first wave of guys coming out the door. While he reigned, Qin Shi Huang wanted to make sure his tomb was a very good approximation of his own legacy. So naturally, thousands of laborers worked tirelessly for decades to create a tomb worthy of China's emperor. It's estimated that 700,000 laborers are thought to have worked on the tomb, which took nearly 40 years to build. Qin Shi Huang only even lived to be 49, so good thing they finished that in time, eh? Qin Shi Huang himself is thought to be buried beneath an enormous pyramid-shaped mound that stands a good distance from the excavated portion of the tomb. Now, according to historians, the central tomb contains treasures and wondrous objects collected during his life, included a flowing river of pure mercury, which ironically, back then they associated that with immortality, now I think we associate that with poisoning. Soil testing the nearby areas has revealed elevated levels of mercury in the dirt, so this might actually be true. However, no one is 
too eager to go digging or check? Since it sounds like Kin Shi Huang kitted this place out like a video game dungeon to keep any would-be Nathan Drakes or Lara Crofts from raiding this uncharted tomb. The tomb is said to be protected by ancient ballistas and complex mechanisms that will fire arrows at any potential grave robbers and make Indiana Jones blush. And that mercury vapor probably is not doing anybody any favors either. In any case, the Chinese government has been in no rush to explore what's down there. It's best to let the sleeping dead lie, especially when he has got thousands of terracotta bodyguards who, I don't know, maybe they're cursed, maybe they'll come to life. I just wouldn't mess with it. Number two, King Tut's artifacts. The new Grand Egyptian Museum was finally opened to the public in 2021 after many delays. And while that's quite recent, the contents displayed inside, they certainly are not. For the first time in history, many of King Tut's ancient belongings will be on display. Now, prior to this museum being opened, we only saw about 150 artifacts from his tomb. They all went on tour, like Kiss, you know, they just went on tour. But now this museum in a beautiful space that spans over 7,000 square meters. It's awesome. Now, cut back to the initial discovery, not so great. November 4th, 1922, ancient history was unearthed. A team of researchers led by British archaeologist Howard Carter discovered this entrance, the literal entrance to King Tut's tomb. Now, only three weeks later, King Tut's actual tomb was then unearthed. Now, has it been disturbed in over 3,000 years? And then we came in with some shovels and made him an exhibit. Awesome. Grab your tickets. Hashtag Tut. This discovery spawned the curse of the pharaohs. Why, of course, because almost every expert involved in that discovery, they all experienced horrible luck. Many of them actually just died. Tragic events. It was crazy. Howard Carter, the archaeologist who discovered the actual tomb, he gave a paperweight to his friend Bruce Ingham as a gift. Now, that paperweight in hand, pun intended, was a mummified hand wearing a bracelet. Inscribed on said bracelet read the phrase, Cursed be he who moves my body. Ingham's house then burned to the ground not long after receiving said gift, and then when he tried to rebuild the home, it was then destroyed in a flood. That's just one example. Some people, like I said, straight up died. Car accidents, just random medical issues, sicknesses, like I said about plagues and Egyptian mummies, <sighs> breathing in some old shit, it's not great. Lots of dark history being unearthed. That's all King Tut. And finally, number one, the Bjorktop runestone. Vikings regularly used runes in their runic magic. But yeah, I mean, what else would you use for runic magic? Vikings would inscribe the stones, and they could wield the magical power of words, the thum, if you will. This magic could take all forms, blessings, curses, and I'm sure in at least one case, probably a pretty sick fireball. The Bjorktop runestone, and I know for a fact I am not pronouncing that correctly, so please feel free to let me know in the comments how it should be going, is a famous example of a runestone and some runic magic. Located in Blakinji, Sweden, the rock itself itself is surrounded by mystery, and the inscription on it carries a pretty scary warning. I, master of the runes, conceal here runes of power. Incessantly plagued by maleficence, doomed to insidious death is he who breaks this monument. I prophesize the destruction. Okay, so that uh, honestly sounds pretty clear cut and dry what is happening with this runestone. It sounds like this stone guarantees a nice rainfall every year. No, of course not. It's a very scary warning. No one really knows what the Bjorktope runestone represents though, or even if it's buried on top of something significant. Is it a tomb? No one's really willing to mess with it to find out. Kratos hasn't come by to ravage this place for upgrade materials yet. Is that too many God of War Ragnarok references in one video? No, of course not. If I had my way, it'd be Ragnarok all the way down. Anyway, back on topic. Anthropologists and archaeologists have done their level best to ascertain just what's going on here without tripping any possible runic curses, just to be safe. A tomb is one of the most popular theories, but there are others, suggesting that possibly it's a memorial for a real burial far, far away possibly to mislead somebody, grave robbers maybe. A second suggestion is that it is a mighty shrine for Odin, authoring him runes of power in exchange for blessings of fertility and harvest. A third, significantly less popular theory offered by some researchers is that it was put in place to somehow control the mystical powers of Icelandic singer, songwriter, and my personal hero Bjork, who has been known to be completely uncontrollable. Number five, the Sword of Dainsleth. The Sword of Dainsleth, and hey, there's a good chance I'm pronouncing that wrong, so let me know, is among the most famous of weapons in Nordic myths, a legendary cursed sword of yore. Dainsliff was the blade of King Hogni, who was a noble king in ancient Viking stories. The Dainsliff sword was handcrafted by the dwarf Dane, who was said to be among the most skilled craftsmen in all of the realms. The name of the sword literally translates to Dane's legacy. However, the sword had been imbued with a dark, 
powerful magic energy. Whenever the Mighty Dane Slyph was drawn, it could not be sheathed until blood had coated its blade. Someone had to die to feed the thirst of blood that quelled inside the tempered steel. Not just that too, but this cursed sword must have had like a very specific hunger pang for neck blood, as the sword had to behead an enemy. Sounds like an extremely high maintenance cursed sword. Surely all blood tastes the same, right? To a sword? I don't know, maybe I'm being dismissive. The sword features prominently in the story of Prose Edda, an ancient Nordic textbook thought to date back from the 12th century, which told the story of King Hogni and his beautiful daughter Hild, while he warred in the eternal battle of the kings. According to this old story, Hogni came to meet other kings across the land, and brought his daughter to introduce them. However, a jealous rival king seized his daughter and stole her away. Hogni gathered as many of his most fearsome warriors as he could to reclaim her, and sailed west in pursuit of his daughter. He found her on an island, yet her captor had attempted to persuade Hogni into making peace with him. But Hogni told him it was too late to end that, I mean, makes sense, you stole my daughter bro. But the Daneslef had been drawn, and it couldn't be sheathed until he had been beheaded. The legend then goes on to state that the two men fought for 143 years. But I'm hoping they took like two 15 minute breaks a day at least. And my ghouls and goblins, if you love the scares we put out for you, the nicest way to show thanks is to toss a little like and subscribe our way. If you're already subscribed, you're the coolest. If you're not, well I still like you lots, but you could really win me over with a like and subscribe. Just saying, if you wanted to get on my good side. Number 4. Runes of Power To the Vikings, runes and runic magic were a cornerstone of their culture. Runes were their language, after all, their written language. The old poem Havamal explains that Odin, the Allfather, discovered the runes when he hung himself from the world tree, Yggdrasil, in order to attain enlightenment. As he hung on the tree, blowing for 9 nights and 9 days, he found himself slowly fading away, ready to be taken away to hell, when as he was about to die, he found the runes, took them, and earned his life, and bestowed them to humanity. Carving a rune into an object imbued it with a great deal of power. With the right inscriptions and the aid of a powerful seeress or sorceress, you could predict the future, protect yourself, or your family from misfortune. You could even imbue a blade with powerful energy. Skyrim got that right exactly. As well, runes were said to be the key to activating conjurations, curses, and spells. But as well, runic inspirations were found to bless just everyday things. Oftentimes they told stories within them too. Runestones were also used in Viking culture as landmarks, and the inscriptions they bore contained powerful magic within them. Take the Glavendrup stone, which contains a powerful warning to anyone who dares to move it. Listen to what it says. Ragnhildr placed this stone in memory of Ali the Pale, priest of the sanctuary, honorable thane of the retinue. Ali's sons made the monument in memory of their father, and his wife in memory of her husband, and Soti carved these runes in memory of his lord. Thor, hallow these runes. A warlock be he who damages this stone, drags it in memory of another. So this rune stone's got a little curse put in place to make sure no one disturbs the slumber of Ali the Pale. Perhaps one of the most famous rune stones in the world is the Björktop rune stone in Sweden. A mysterious rune stone whose purpose is not fully known, but bears another frightening inscription. Listen to this one, and I, I gotta put a bit of a voice on for this one, you'll understand. <clears throat> I, master of the runes, conceal here runes of power. Incessantly plagued by maleficence, doomed to insidious death is he who breaks this monument. Do forgive me, but can you imagine me just reading that normal? Would not have worked. So we might not know what the Bjorktope runestone is for, but we can say with certainty no one is willing to move it to find out what might be built on top of it, just in case runic magic is real and they don't want to experiment with dooming themselves to an insidious death plagued by malfeasance. That sounds terrible. Number three, the Nidaros Cathedral. The Nidaros Cathedral is a popular tourist hotspot in Norway. Renowned for its beautiful architecture, it's a stunning monument to Norway's very rich history, and it's also quite known as one of the more haunted buildings in the entire country. It's located in the city center of Trondheim, named after the Trondheim Nidaros, which was the capital of Norway during the era of Vikings. In the early days, it was a humble, simple wooden chapel built to serve as the tomb of Saint Olaf, a Viking king who helped introduce Christianity to Viking culture and would be remembered as the patron saint of Norway. It was the traditional location for the consecration of new kings of Norway. Now if you're looking at this and you think, wow, what a building. That's because it took 230 years to build it, so I would hope it looks great. From the years 1070 to 1300, it was worked on round the clock. Now let's get into the most important part, and the only part we even care about this building is the ghost. I just spent so much time talking about architectural history when we could be talking about a ghost. Norway's most famous 
famous ghost is known as the Monk, and he's an apparition that manifests as a medieval monk with a bloody gash along its throat, dripping onto the floor. The Monk's first sighting was in 1924, and since then has become a bit of a staple of the cathedral, with countless sightings and tourists reporting hearing, seeing, or feeling the Monk around the cathedral. The first sighting was from a bishop's wife during service, and she claims that she saw the Monk standing behind the congregation with bright glowing blue eyes. She said his face was sharp and glowing, and when he raised his hand that blood started to pour from his throat. The priest who was tending to the service at the time claims that while he was speaking, he felt an unspeakable pain in his throat, as if something was lodged in it. Ugh. Number 2. Viking Graves Now the Vikings were a very superstitious people. Ghosts were a very common belief and possible threat in medieval Norway. Your soul could go just about all over. You might end up in Valhall, the realm of Odin where you can drink and fight to your heart's content for eternity. Or you could end up in Folkvanger, Freya's realm, a lush, bountiful field that sprawled forever. Or you could end up in Helheim, which was just a terrible, cold, dismal place. Imagine spending your entire life in freezing Scandinavia, dying and then waking up in a different freezing afterlife. I would be so upset. Of course, if you didn't qualify for any of these afterlife options, you could always end up with your soul trapped on the earth and reanimated as a ghost or a corpse zombie monster called a Draugr, which anyone who spent too much time inside of any of Skyrim's caves can tell you are a real nuisance. So Vikings had to come up with all sorts of ways to make sure that nobody came back to cause any problems for the village. No doubt you've heard of Viking funerary ships or their pyres, where their dead were sent off into the water in a longboat with possessions that might befit them in the afterlife, and then lit ablaze with an arrow. But oftentimes, that was more for higher caste members of society. Other burials were traditional, but the body was kept in the home for a few days to prepare. The Vikings took all sorts of fun precautions to make sure they wouldn't have a Draugr on their hands. The head was wrapped in bandages. Oftentimes, the feet would be bound or sewn together, or even needles would be placed into the feet to make sure just in case they came back to life, they wouldn't be able to walk. Corpses were brought into houses feet first because they believed the spirit of the person would not be able to see where they were being taken for burial and thus unable to find their way back home. If they had the time too, Vikings would build something really fun called a corpse door. An opening they built into a home which was bricked up and when the burial was ready would be smashed through and the dead would be carried through this feet first. The belief was that the reanimated could only enter their home from the way they had left, so if there was no corpse door anymore, the Draugr wouldn't be able to get in and it would just sort of paw at the door like a sad cat. Honestly, the logic is there. This one makes complete sense to me. And number one, the Dorset Grave. The Dorset Mass Grave is one of the scariest and confusing archaeological discoveries ever discovered. Let me ask you, what's more fun than a barrel of monkeys? You might be thinking, a barrel of Vikings? No, I'm thinking about a mass grave full of headless Viking bodies. No? Okay, well you and I find different things very fun, I suppose. Way back, way back, way back, all the way back in 2008, a group of archaeologists were on a fairly routine digging operation in Dorset, a quaint little seaside town in England. They were supervising a digging operation to improve local roads and were on set to see if there was anything of note to find. You know, maybe an old coin or an arrowhead. And for the first few days of the job, nothing noteworthy was really coming up until they came across the mass pile of 54 entangled Viking corpses all missing their heads. I guess that was kind of noteworthy. If it was just a bunch of headless Viking bodies, that would be one thing. But the mass grave was just riddled in confusing details. Their skulls were missing, but as well, their rib cages, arm, and leg bones were all scattered around, surrounded by discarded teeth. There were no clothes or weaponry to be found at all. So what in Odin's name happened here because absolutely nothing I can imagine is pleasant. My first thought is that this was some sort of insane event horizon-esque scenario where a bunch of Vikings opened up a portal to hell and had a blood party. The teeth found around the grave had all been filed down neatly as if a craftsman had done it. Now it goes without saying that, you know, Viking dental surgery was not going to be a painless process, meaning this had to be excruciating, suggesting it was either done by a very careful tormentor or it was done to themselves to intimidate opponents by showing how gritty and fierce they are. Could not tell you which one is better. Now as good as my theory about a bunch of Vikings opening up a Hellraiser scenario or something is, archaeologists had some different ideas. Ideas. They theorized that looking at the wounds on the ribs and the torso, that they were very surgical blows, which isn't really what you'd expect from a rabid Viking brawl. The archaeologists thought that these men were either 
offered up as part of a horrifying sadistic ritual, or it was a big time mass sentencing where everybody was rounded up and sentenced to death. Explains too where all the weapons and gear had gone, as these men had been brought here and then left there for a very, very long time. Anyone else feel like that also kind of sounds like it might be the world's most terrifying puzzle to try and put together, trying to figure out where all those bones go? Maybe just me? Maybe I've been working on this channel too long and my sense of humor has been changed permanently. Number five on this list is a cannon. Hong Kong is pretty much surrounded by water. Their entire culture is very connected to the water with fishing and boats. That's why finding things in the water isn't totally shocking. However, when that thing is a super heavy, super old cannon, then it's a tad bit more interesting. History Things says, experts believe that this discovery might lead them to uncover more hidden treasures beneath the harbor city. Bill Jeffrey, the archaeologist working with Hong Kong's underwater heritage group, comments that we see this as the tip of the iceberg. The Hong Kong SAR is 60% water and yet nearly no archaeology has been done underwater here. The granite stock, which is known as the cross piece that can be found on most anchors, was around 6 feet long. This piece lay 10 feet below water and was situated near Hong Kong's high island. After investigating this ancient maritime artifact, experts have discovered that this granite stock dates back between 960 to 1278 AD. This anchor fits the exact style and material that would have been used during China's Song Dynasty. I think what makes this so mysterious is that comment about how hardly any of the water has been explored for archaeology. Finding something like this underwater as they did can only mean one thing. Either somebody partied a little too hard 1,000 years ago and decided that taking a cannon out in the middle of the ocean and throwing it overboard was a good idea, or, and much more realistically, there are more archaeological finds to be had underwater. Who knows how many things they could discover just lying at the bottom of the ocean. Number four on this list is a tiny bird. Okay, so I'll be honest folks, this one isn't super mysterious, but it did come from China and it is wicked cool. The artifact is a very small bird sculpture, literally so tiny that you could probably fit 20 of them in one hand. It's made from blackened bone and doesn't really look like much. Just a very basic bird potentially sitting atop of a perch. So what makes this thing so special and why has it made our list? Well, this little bird is pretty freaking old. This tiny sculpture of a bird discovered at Lingjing, China is 13,500 years old. We're talking about something that is hundreds to thousands of generations older than we are right now. This Paleolithic bird being the ripe young age of 13,500 years is the oldest discovered 3D piece of art in all of East Asia. The way that it's made also indicates that there are a lot more of these little guys to be found. How smooth the sculpture is shows that this wouldn't have been a one-off from the artist and they knew what they were doing. I guarantee that whoever made this that many years ago couldn't even begin to comprehend that their tiny sculpture would make for a talking point on a YouTube video this many years later and honestly, that's pretty cool. Number three on this list is bronze vessels. Indiana University says that these bronze vessels were found in tombs and were made for use in rites performed on ancestral altar or cast specifically for burial with the dead. Only Chinese kings and high-ranking nobility could afford such expensive and labor-intensive artifacts which required a knowledge of mining, smelting, metallurgy, and casting to execute. From Shang Dynasty records comprised of some 200,000 inscriptions on bone and turtle shells, we know that China Chinese ancestors were procreated with elaborate rites, feasts, and sacrifices. If ancestors were displeased with the activities of their descendants or the rituals offered to them, they might fail to act on their progeny's behalf or even cause their descendants harm. This could come in the form of poor harvests, droughts, or famine. The Chinese believed in a complex world of spirits which comprised a multitude of nature deities, royal ancestors, and others who controlled important earthly phenomena such as weather, harvests, births, deaths, and military campaigns. So it's pretty clear that these bronze vessels played a role in the rituals the Chinese performed with their dead, but the passage also leads me to believe that they may have been involved in causing people to die in the first place. These are ritualistic artifacts and consider Considering the Chinese believed in a complex world of spirits, I don't think it's unrealistic to think that they may have used these in rituals to curse someone with a poor harvest or even death. 
To use these bronze vessels in appealing to a deity and have that deity help them with their current issue. Of course, I'm only speculating here and the exact use of these things in rituals will probably remain a mystery. Number 2 on this list is the Sangs We Do Masks. The Sangs We Do Masks are some of the most recent and most mysterious discoveries that archaeologists have made in China in quite some time. Aaron Reich says, Remains of a gold mask dating back 3,000 years were found in a huge treasure trove of artifacts discovered at an archaeological site in China's Sichuan province, which sheds more light on an ancient civilization that remains mysterious to historians. The mask consists of around 84% gold, measures 28 centimeters high and 23 centimeters wide, and weighs about 280 grams, according to the English language daily reported. But According to Lei Yu, head of the Sangzui Di site excavation team, the whole mask would weigh over half a kilogram. If a whole mask like this was found, it wouldn't just be the largest and heaviest gold object from that period found in China, but the heaviest gold object found from that time period anywhere. The mask remains one of over 500 artifacts found in the cache at the site. The Sichuan province is one of the most mysterious provinces in China. These masks are gorgeous too and look to be extremely valuable. No one currently knows what they were used for. Something this beautiful has to be connected to royalty or to some sort of ancient and important ritual. Potentially something that someone might wear when performing a ritual that would connect them to a god or some other deity. Very little is known about this dynasty and their practices so sadly these masks and what they were used for will also remain a mystery. And finally number one on this list is the terracotta army. The terracotta army has got to be the most famous Chinese artifacts to have ever been discovered. There's just simply nothing in the world that comes close to rivaling their uniqueness. Chinese workers digging a well in 1974 made a startling discovery. Thousands of life-size terracotta figures of an army prepared for battle. Now called the Terracotta Army or Terracotta Warriors, the figures are located in three pits near the city of Xi'an in China's Shangzi province. After the warriors were discovered, the site it became a museum and a Yunsko World Heritage Site in 1987. The pits are situated less than one mile to the northeast of a pyramid-shaped mausoleum constructed for the first emperor of China, Xi Zhangchuang. According to Yunsko World Heritage Center, archaeologists suspect that the unexcavated tomb could contain an entire replica of the city of Xi'an, which the warriors guard. The three pits contain an estimated 8,000 life-size terracotta figures, of which about 2,000 have been excavated. The figures were created to serve the emperor in the afterlife and include a mix of chariots, cavalry, armored soldiers, and archers. There are high ranking officers, and one of the pits, number three actually, served as a command post for the army and contains an honor guard and ornate chariot for the force's chief commander. All three pits are active archaeological sites, and visitors can see excavations taking place. Maybe the most mysterious thing about all of this is what is in the unexcavated excavated tomb that they're guarding. Based on how the tomb is situated, it's currently impossible to go inside without destroying some of the history and this is why it remains unsearched. But one has to imagine that whatever is inside of it could be extremely valuable. Whatever is in that unopened tomb warranted the building of over 8,000 statues to guard it. I don't know if I've ever done anything 8,000 times, let alone build extremely intricate statues. Hit me with a comment down below on what you believe these ancient soldiers are actually guarding. Number five, the anguished man painting. Yeah, at first I thought this whole thing was a hoax, but checks off all the right boxes, doesn't it? Artist is an unknown painter, there's real blood mixed in with the paint. The artist then took their own life after they finished the painting. Sounds a bit made up. Well, the original owner, Sean Robinson, claims that his grandmother was the one who actually inherited this painting and gave it to him, saying that there was real blood mixed into this. Okay. His grandmother had claimed that the picture had always seemed to be attached to evil, and even saw a dark figure resembling a man always standing around the painting. After having strange things happen around Sean's house, he too said that he started seeing a shadowy figure, almost like a man now, standing at the bottom of his bed night after night. Sean decided to reach out to Ed and Lorraine Warren, paranormal investigators from Connecticut. He tried 
keeping the painting around at one point. Even tried to sell it online, but for some reason it never sold. Sean said the painting became too dangerous and things were getting worse around the house and decided to give the Warrens the painting for safe keepings. Good idea, Sean. They have the painting locked away in their basement at their home, aka the occult museum for everything haunted. The painting is kept out of sight and no one is allowed to even look at it in person. For it draws evil energy, right? What do you think? I mean, the more I look at this thing, the more it scares the hell out of me. It is jarring. Number four, devil's rocking chair. I love a good rocking chair. Something soothing about it, you know? All the motion. Very relaxing. Rocking chairs. Rocking on their own, however. No, 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 I don't do that at all. And this one is supposed to be, you know whose personal chair. The Devil's Rocking Chair, which was bought for $67,000 from Ed and Lorraine Warren's site, is in the care of one Zach Baggins. This guy runs a haunted museum in Vegas and purchased the chair understanding fully what it does and is. The chair, originally used in the exorcism of David Glatzel in the 80s by the Warrens themselves, a true case involving murder and demonic possession. A true case. Some have seen a beast sitting in the chair, some have seen a dark shadowy man. And the horrifying part, Baggins had to shut down his exhibit in 2019 because the chair was causing guests to have emotional breakdowns and episodes. One guest even passed out walking directly above the chair on the staircase. Slowly started to become a safety hazard and Zach decided to remove the newest haunted item from his exhibit completely. Before Zach put the rocking chair in his exhibit, he said the only day it was in his home, him and a friend both both had a very strange breakdown. Both of them crying uncontrollably and even speaking religious sayings obsessively. Number three, Thomas Busby chair. I thought it would definitely be more like skulls and dolls and stuff, but it seems so far that's pretty much only furniture holds evil spirits. How about that? Another chair, haunted of course, and this tale is a chilling one. Not like the others aren't. The Thomas Busby Stoop Chair, or also famously known as Dead Man's Chair, is said to be a cursed object from the owner himself, Mr. Busby. This hardwood, allegedly haunted oak chair was cursed by the murderer Thomas Busby before his execution hanging in 1702 in North North Yorkshire, England. Thomas Busby was arrested, tried, and condemned to death after he murdered his father-in-law, Daniel Audie, in 1702. Audie and Busby were running a coin counterfeiting business. After an argument about the business, Busby killed Audie. One variation of the story has Busby cursing the chair while on his way to the execution, whereas another says he was drunk in the chair that he was arrested in and cursed him. Right then and there. Due to the many deaths later attributed to people sitting in the chair, the landlord donated it to the Thirsk Museum in the same town where it is having difficulty with guests sitting on top of it. It now stays hung above the floor near the ceiling where no one can even sit on it. That's good. Numerous deaths have been linked to this chair, from soldiers not returning home from war, to delivery drivers crashing their trucks hours later, to people even having strokes and heart attacks sitting in it. Death seems to be intimate anywhere this thing goes. It's been hung up since 2014 and remains there today. Number two, the Cursed Mirror. Originally sitting in the main foyer in its 17th century antebellum home in Louisiana, this haunted object has been witness to some nasty history. The Myrtles Plantation in Louisiana is the home to deep-rooted slavery. The American South is known for its disgusting use of slave labor and would be the home in which this haunted piece sits. The house owned first by Mr. and Mrs. Clark Woodruff. These were racist plantation owners and violent ones at that. It is said that the couple were very sadistic towards abuse of the slave. A young woman by the name of Chloe was particularly abused when eavesdropping on a conversation Woodruff was having one night, resulting in him cutting both of her ears off. That's so unnecessary. Her mutilation was hidden, but Chloe planned her revenge quickly and decided to poison a cake which Mrs. Woodruff and her two children would be eating. She killed all three of them and was caught, tried, and hanged for her crime. It is Chloe's ghost in which experts say haunts the cursed mirror from the plantation. Ghostly women are seen in the mirror walking by and smudged handprints are always seen even with new trimmings and polished glass. The cursed mirror is believed to have Chloe's spirit trapped inside of it. By gazing into the mirror, evil things apparently would happen resulting in health problems. Weird things happen around this mirror and where it lays now, that's Ed and Lorraine's business. Ed and Lorraine are taking care of it, of course, thank God, and it sits in the couple's occult museum in Connecticut ungazable. Today, the Myrtles Plantation has been changed into a bed and breakfast, but still remains one of America's most haunted houses. What do you think? And coming in at number one, Annabelle. Possibly the most infamous and dangerous possessed artifact found at the home of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Their occult museum is the home of the Annabelle doll. We know a little bit about this doll, of course, with all the films about her in the last couple years. Tons of people have flocked to the museum to take pics in front of her vase. She rests inside a glass case ominously marked warning. 
positively do not touch. Warned. She was previously owned by a nursing student, Donna, in 1970. Gifted from her mother from a thrift store, after some creepy incidents involving the doll like levitating onto the table and moving around by itself, she took the doll to a medium who revealed it is possessed by the spirit of a little girl who died young. Ed and Lorraine were eventually called after the incidents would not stop, and they offered to take it to their home. However, this is the scary part on the drive home. Ed himself said that the doll was making the car do things out of his control. Stuffed in a bag, doused in holy water, he still felt the presence. The engine kept turning off, power steering would all of a sudden lock up. The hardest part was getting it into a safe locked case in their museum, where it's been ever since. Thank goodness. The doll holds evil power and demonic possession, Lorraine says, and she refuses to even make eye contact with it. Yeah, you know it's bad when they won't even look it in the eye, huh? The museum unfortunately has been shut down since 2019, but the cursed objects still seem to be staying put. Thank goodness. Number five on this list is the sacred book of Abramelin the Mage. This book was written by, and yep, you guys guessed it, Abramelin. Abramelin held a belief that every single person had their own unique personal demon within them. Kinda sounds like the guy who's been through a few rough breakups if you ask me. He believed though that even though we all had this personal demon, that it could be tamed and it could be controlled. Sort of like this inner power that you have that once you're capable of controlling, it will be very, very strong. If you have this inner demon tamed, then you'll be able to perform supernatural feats and abilities that the average human won't be able to do. That's basically what this book is all about. Taming your inner demon and learning to work with it so that you can harness that power. Then, once you've done so, this book will teach you what sort of powers you're able to perform. Now this all sounds pretty legendary, actually. I think that everybody would love to be able to channel some magical part of themselves and perform supernatural feats. The book, as with many on this list though, comes with a downside. If you have this book in your possession, then you're said to be haunted by spirits from another dimension. And these spirits will bring you horrible luck. Maybe if you channel your inner demon quick enough and then get rid of this book, it could be worth it, but something tells me that it's gonna take longer than an afternoon to do that, which probably makes this book too dangerous to use. Number four on this list is the Arabetal. The Arabetal, or the Arabetal de Magia Veritum, is an ancient text that has some questionable things in it. Although the intentions of this book are good, and it may have helped some individuals live a better life, there are dark things in here as well, and the better life can't be said for all people who use this book. Ancient Origins writes, The Arabetal is a Renaissance period grimoire and one of the most influential works of its kind. Unlike some other occult manuscripts that contain dark magic and malicious spells, the Arabetal contains spiritual advice and guidance on how to live an honest and honorable life. The Arabetal is said to have been written in 1575 AD. The author remains unknown, although it has been speculated that it was written by a man named Jacques Gohori. The focus of the Arabetal is on nature and the natural relationships between humanity and a celestial hierarchy. It centers on the positive relationships between the celestial world and humans and the interaction between the two of them. The Arabetal was an extremely influential work for its time. So as we can see, this ancient text isn't inherently evil in nature, or at least that wasn't its initial intention. However, this book has been connected to some urban legends, and one copy of the text in particular is definitely cursed. It's believed that back in the 1600s, this book fell into the property of a young Polish farmer. The farmer grew obsessed with this book and the dark and malicious spells that it contained. He cursed his rivals and made it so that their crops would never grow. He turned into this evil warlock who the whole region feared. Even though they feared him, they weren't going to give up all hope. The people rose up and attacked this warlock farmer. They killed him, but before he died, he cursed his copy of the Arabetal so that whoever reads it will die within 60 days. Needless to say, the people weren't about to test this guy's curse out and they hid the copy of the book away. Nowadays, nobody knows where it went, and it could still possibly be out there. So if you do ever pick up one of these texts and give it a read, then you're basically rolling the dice and just hoping that it wasn't that same copy that got cursed. Number three on this list is the Book of Soiga. 
The Book of Soya is one of the most intriguing books on this list. Humans like things that are hard to come by, things that are rare and often valuable to us. Diamonds are beautiful, but it's actually the rarity and difficulty in finding the diamonds that make them as valuable as they are. Well, the Book of Soiga took a book from those precious stones, and it's definitely hard to come by. The style inspiration says, dating back to the 16th century, the Book of Soiga, also known as the Aldaria, is a Latin essay about demonology with only two known copies copies in existence. One was owned by the scholar John Dee and his elder brother devoted his entire life to decoding the Book of Soiga. Though he successfully determined that the book was full of dark rituals and incantations, he struggled to figure out the final 36 pages. His obsession with figuring out the content of those final pages drove Dee to insanity. Obsessed, he even hired a medium to summon the Archangel Uriel to help with the translation. Speaking through Dee's medium, Uriel apparently explains that the book came into existence when Adam ended paradise and that it could only be interpreted by Archangel Michael. After Dee's death, the book was thought long lost until two copies were found in 1994. Since then, many have been tempted to try and complete these works, but it comes with a serious risk. According to legend, anyone who successfully deciphers those final pages is destined to die in under three years. So dying in three years obviously isn't the best, but the good part about this is because it's so rare, it's pretty unlikely to stumble on this book and give it a read. This is like a legendary Pokemon of cursed books though, so if you do ever come across it, don't read it, but definitely scoop it up and put that thing on eBay. In that case, the Book of Soiga might actually be a blessing. Number two on this list is The Lesser Key of Solomon. This book is so cursed that it doesn't even need to be read to curse you. Literally just being in its proximity can do the trick. Slapped Ham writes, The Lesser Key of Solomon, also known as the Clavica Solomon's Regis, is a cursed grimoire of demonology. Its original authors are unknown, and it's said to be comprised of texts compiled sometime in the 17th century. The book contains passages on how to conjure spirits of the dead and demons and how to control these entities to do your bidding. Curses and invocations also play a large role in the ancient text. Esoteric topics like how to become invisible and locate missing or stolen items are covered. Recipes for love potions and liquors of persuasion are also scattered throughout the book. This definitely isn't the book you want to own. It's reportedly so cursed that it will doom anyone who keeps a copy on their bookshelf. Those who've owned it have reported strange occurrences like pages turning on their own and books violently flying across the room. Strange whispers and shadow creatures have also been reported by owners of the manual. Owning the Lesser Key of Solomon is also believed to bring about catastrophic bad luck. It's said that the only way to break the book's curse is to burn the pages and properly dispose of the ashes. Finally, someone making some sense. How many times have I gone on this channel and talked about how we just need to start burning things? Cursed books. Cursed houses, cursed objects, screw all of it, let's just burn it. At the end of the day, this stuff is really cool, but I'm not out here trying to have my life ruined by some weird book. Burn it hot and let's be done with it. And finally, number one on this list is the Codex Gigas. Codex Gigas is one of the closest things that we have to a Bible for the devil and anything that carries a weight to it like that needs to be on this list. The style inspiration says, at 92 centimeters, the Codex Gigas is the largest extant medieval illuminated manuscript in the world. Just like everything evil, it comes with two names and the Codex Gigas second name is more than a little foreboding, the Devil's Bible. The history of the book is heavy to say the least. It was written by a monk who had broken his spiritual vows, and for his crime, the monk was sentenced to die entombed behind a brick wall. The night before his death, the monk began chronicling everything he knew about the human experience in a book. So, the story goes, realizing he wouldn't have time to finish it. He apparently summoned Lucifer and asked him to complete the project in exchange for his soul. The book was then allegedly completed by the devil himself. It's overflowing with dark rituals and imagery and even includes 19-inch drawings of the devil and other demonic entities. 
Now, obviously, because this was written by the devil, there are some side effects from reading the thing. People have reported watching their friends become possessed as they read it. Now, it's currently on display for people to go take a look at the National Library of Sweden. But be very careful if you ever do go take a look because clearly, this is the work of the devil. Number five on this list is the Untitled Grimoires. The Untitled Grimoires were written by a witch and really not the type of book that you want to be reading before bedtime. Or actually reading it all for that matter. Digital Trend says, The Untitled Grimoires is a set of two handwritten spiral bound spell books sold by an online retailer for nearly $14,000 back in 2013. The books were handwritten in the 1960s by Persephone Adrasta Eoreen, a high priestess of Wicca who supposedly led her own coven. All 250 pages are filled with incantations, spells, enchantments, and details on how to summon spirits and demons. However, there was a serious catch. The seller warned buyers that any non-believers who messed with the books would bring a deadly curse upon themselves, while Persephone herself explicitly tells readers on the first page that proceeding with the book would have serious consequences. She wrote, To those not of the craft, the reading of this book is forbidden. Proceed no further, or justice will exact a swift and terrible retribution, and you will surely suffer at the hand of the craft. So, literally anyone who can't perform dark magic already can't read this book and learn how to perform dark magic without dark magic coming and cursing them. Seems like a kind of a stupid way to get people to join your club, but I guess I'm not familiar with the ongoings of witches. Either way, there is no doubt that this book is deeply cursed. I can't imagine spending 14 grand on this thing unless you literally were already familiar with dark magic yourself and I guess then you could make use of the book, but that's not me. People who have tried to read this thing have had some horrible tragedies befall them, so I highly do not recommend it. Number 4 on this list is Pseudodomarchia de Mona. Wow, okay, that was an absolute freaking mouthful, so I'm not gonna be calling it that anymore because it's also called the False Hierarchy of Demons, and I'm gonna be saying that from here on out. Ancient Origins says this is a great compendium from the 16th century dictating the names of 69 demons. The list initially appeared as an appendix to a book about demonology and witchcraft by Johann Weyer. The son of a civic service merchant, Johann Weyer, was a Dutch doctor and occult practitioner born in the Netherlands in 1515. Well versed in Latin from a young age, Weyer quickly became a student of Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, a famous magician, theologian, and occultist in Antwerp. It appears that Weir's fascination with magic began while working under Agapipa, but later escalated after he became a doctor in his own right. He was summoned to a particular fortune teller's court case and thereby asked by the judge for advice on the topic. The court case started his interest in researching the witchcraft way of life, culminating with his decision to attempt to defend those who were accused of practicing. 27 years after this case, when Weir was 62 years old, he published The False Hierarchy of Demons. This book, as with most that study demons, also talks about how to summon and control these demons. This book also focuses a lot on witchcraft too, something that became a deep obsession for Weyer. Definitely a book that you should avoid and one that could hold some serious curses. Number 3 on this list is the Ars Notoria. The Ars Notoria is an ancient text which grants the person who studies it a perfect memory. Something that sounds great from the outside, but it isn't as cool as it's cracked up to be. Ancient Origins writes, As part of a larger collection known as the Lesser Keys of Solomon, the Ars Notoria is a book that is said to allow followers a mastery of academia, giving them greater eloquence, a perfect memory, and wisdom. The Ars Notoria is one of five books within the Lesser Keys of Solomon, an anonymous text that was compiled from other works in the 17th century and focuses on demonology. The Ars Notoria is the oldest portion of the Lesser of the Keys Grimoire, dating back to the 13th century. However, the texts contained within are a collection of orations, prayers, and magical words which date back to well before the 1200s. The prayers are in several languages including Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. It was not a book of spells or potions, but a book of prayers and orations that are said to strengthen and focus one's mental powers by beseeching God for intellectual gifts. Among these intellectual gifts is the concept of a perfect memory. 
Those, those who practice liberal arts such as arithmetic, geometry, and philosophy are promised a mastery of their subject if they devote themselves to the Ars Notoria. Within, it describes a daily process of visualization, contemplation, and orations intended to enhance the practitioner's focus and memory. So here's the thing guys, that all sounds well and good and, and very useful, but I don't think that people understand what a perfect memory actually means. It means that there is literally nothing at any given point that you will ever forget. The license plate of that one car that cut you off, that one passing comment that the cashier said about the milk that you bought, the strange handshake that you had with your friend the other day. Literally nothing at all, you're not going to forget anything. Think about how much noise is going to be going on in your head at one given time if you can't forget anything. This is the curse of this book and it's why a lot of people who have studied it in depth have lost their minds. If you're going to remember everything in the world then there also needs to be a way to turn it off every now and again. To finally get some silence in your head. Sometimes forgetting things really is the best thing for us. Number 2 on this list is The Picatrix. The Picatrix is definitely a book that should be avoided and it's mainly for how freaking grotesque it is. It was initially written in Arabic back in the 11th century and it's a book that's centered around astrology and magic. It teaches the individuals who study it how to concoct crazy spells and make magical potions. What has thrust it into the limelight, as I mentioned earlier, is how freaking gross it is. The magical potions and the spells in here are just disgusting and they're honestly plain wrong. Various body parts, various fluid from said body parts and other weird stuff is regularly called upon in this text. The following is a literal passage from the book on how to make a spell. Take 4 ounces of the blood of a black dog, 2 ounces each of pig's blood and brains, and 1 ounce of donkey brains. Mix all of this together until well blended. When you give this medicine to someone in food or drink, he will hate you. And like, yeah, duh, if anyone blended up a bunch of brains and then gave it to me to drink, then I would kind of hate them as well. Many people think that this book is cursed based on the horrible spells in it, but it honestly might not be and could just be super weird. Either way, probably best to be avoided. And number one on this list is the Voynich Manuscript. The Voynich Manuscript is an illustrated codex that is handwritten in a writing system or language that no one understands. By using some advanced carbon dating, we can determine that it was made back in the early 15th century. We're pretty sure that based on the style of writing, artwork, and language that's in this book, it was most likely made in Italy. The manuscript contains 240 pages in it, and even though it was discovered a long time ago, no one has any idea what it truly means. This could be a good thing though, because the current prevailing wisdom is that whoever discovered exactly what this book says and means, they're going to be cursed. Some think that this book has an ancient alien curse that's attached to it and that it was dumped in Italy hundreds of years ago by said extraterrestrials. Others believe that there were some deep devil worshippers who made this book after finally making contact with the devil. Either way, so far we have no idea what it says and if things maintain how they've been, we probably won't ever know. Which for a book like the Voynich Manuscript? might actually be for the best. Number two, Ballista Balls. You know, the last couple years, I think, had all of us acting pretty strange. You know, maybe you got through it by binging all of Tiger King in a day. Maybe you got really into making a sourdough. Maybe you returned a cursed artifact you stole when you were a teenager. We all went through a strange period. In 2020, an anonymous source returned an ancient artifact that they'd stolen as a teenager to the Israeli government. A Bronze Age Ballista Ball fired during the Great Jewish Revolt by the Romans. The thief swapped wiped them as a teenager when visiting with a group of friends and had went on to live a fairly normal life. Had a nice career, found a partner, sired some children, but he had said that throughout his entire life he felt as if there was a weight over him, as if he had some invisible presence crushing down on him. He said no matter how long it had been or how much his life had moved past this one act of delinquency, his heart could never move from it. And he felt as if he had been cursed to forever bear its guilt. During the event of the last few years, he said it stirred in him this apocalyptic feeling that made him feel like he had to return the ballista balls in hopes of finally clearing his consciousness. I hope he didn't think he did all that. Through Facebook, he ended up getting put towards the right channels to return it. But you know what's kind of bizarre? 
This isn't even the first time that someone's returned a pair of cursed ballista balls, because in 2015, an almost identical story played out. In 2015, two ballista balls were returned to the Israeli authorities anonymously alongside a note saying, I took these in 1995 from a residential quarter at the foot of the summit. They have brought me nothing but trouble. Please do not steal antiquities. Well, I've got to say it's a nice change of pace to hear about people trying to undo the curse before things got too irrevocable. And a pretty simple, easy follow message for you kids at home. Don't steal antiquities. Unless you're Indiana Jones, that should be fairly easy for all of us to follow. And finally, number one, the Black Prince's Ruby. The Black Prince's Ruby was once thought to be the biggest ruby in the world. Unfortunately though, upon closer inspection, this mighty ruby turned out to be an imposter. A spinel disguised as a ruby, a mineral known as the Great Imposter. Perhaps then that it's fitting that this cursed gemstone's legacy began with a story of deceit. Prior to being the crowning jewel, in the imperial state crown of the UK, the Black Prince's ruby first appeared in the 14th century, where it was owned by Abu Said, who was the last sultan of Granada. Little history lesson for you, so don't fall asleep too much. In the late 13th century, Granada was losing a war to King Pedro the Cruel, who historically was not known to be nice. You know, given the title. The Christian kingdom of Castilla was taking more and more of Said's territory, and so to arrange a peaceful end to the war, the Sultan had requested an audience with King Pedro in Castilla and arranged a meeting. And they came to an agreement and the Sultan was welcomed. When the Sultan and his arriving party thought they were welcomed as guests, they were surprised to see King Pedro welcome the with drawn swords. He was King Pedro the Cruel, after all. I don't need to tell you what happened next, but King Pedro stripped the jewel off of the Sultan's corpse. Soon after, King Pedro found himself in a new war against his brother Henry of Trastamara for Castilla's throne. King Pedro commissioned the Black Prince Edward of England for aid, and as payment for his services, gave him the ruby, where it would get its name, the Black Prince's ruby. Edward would return home to England, but Pedro would fall in battle to his brother. Edward the Black Prince would die slowly and painfully from a disease before he could inherit the throne, giving the ruby to his son, Richard the second. Richard would become king, but he was taken out by Henry IV, who took the ruby as well, who then passed from a slow illness, giving the ruby to his son Henry V. This is the worst thing to re-gift possible. It would pass from a lineage of kings until eventually finding its way to the Tudors, and then eventually after that, finding a permanent home in the London Tower, amidst the crown jewel collection, where it's been sealed away, never to be claimed again. Because just look at the history of this thing. This is not something you ever want to unwrap. Whew. Number five, St. Clair's fingernails and her hair. Now some people say that fingernails and hair continue to grow after the body passes away. This is commonly repeated, but actually not true, because rather it's the skin around the fingernails retracting that gives the illusion that the fingernails are still growing. I thought I would just toss in a totally unrelated fun fact you can use at a party. These fingernails aren't growing at all because they're not attached to anybody, and they're kept in a glass box alongside some of St. Clair's wonderful curls, like the world's worst and possibly stinkiest time capsule. Now, St. Clair was often overshadowed by her more famous mentor, Francis of Assisi, but St. Clair was her own woman, accomplished in her own right. She founded her own order of nuns, the Poor Clares. Inspired by Francis's teachings when she was a teenager, she renounced the world and founded an order based on the ideals of extreme poverty and contemplation. I should probably look into this order because being extremely broke and contemplating being extremely broke is about 99% of what I do. The order spread popularity and houses of Poor Clares were established far away from her home convent in Assisi. Now it's said that part of what made St. Clair's decision to give up the worldly life so inspiring was that not only was she blessed to be born into a family of great wealth, but oh, va va voom, St. Clair was a real stunner. Now, you know, the depictions we have to work with may not look like much, but they called her the first Jenner for her luscious lips and flowing locks. As proof of her devotion, Frances trimmed her beautiful extravagant hair as a physical manifestation of rejecting her former vain existence. As you can see, I'm not quite there yet. I'm still quite happy with my vain, disgusting hair. Now, someone down the line managed to get a hold of St. Clair's hair and fingernails. Maybe they were just sweeping the barber room floor. These uh, treasures, for lack of a better word, were kept and encased in a reliquary at the Basilica named in her honor. This also contains a rock crystal flask with her fingernails. Really not sure why anyone felt they needed to keep that. Uh, I'm not sure how holy these are, but hey, 
I'm not a saint or a bishop or a pope or any of that stuff. I'm just a YouTuber and I'm barely that even. But if you want to hear more of me narrating some of these strange and peculiar parts of the big globe we share, Top 5 Scary is the place to be. We got a little something for everyone. So make sure you click on through, like this video, subscribe and hit that little bell and we can keep on bringing you screams every single day, twice a day and then some. But do that at the end of this video, okay? We got way more weird Catholic relics coming up for you. Number four, papal hearts. You know, they say some people wear their hearts on their sleeves, and some people collect 22 hearts in marble urns inside a beautiful reliquary. We all have our hobbies, we all collect things. Just make sure those hearts are still in their original packaging, otherwise, you know, they're totally worthless. Well, these aren't just regular old hearts, these are the hearts of 22 former popes. Obviously, obviously, they're former popes if their hearts are, obviously. <laughs> at the Church of Santi Vincenzo e Anastasio at Trivia. Oof, that's a mouthful, we're not saying that again. You can find the sealed hearts of 22 popes in marble urns for all to appreciate. The popes are listed to the left of the altar, with the oldest coming in all the way from the 15th century with Sixtus V to the fresh and still beating heart of Leo XIII in 1903. Now this custom of separating a pope's organs from the corpse sounds a bit Strange, or a bit Egyptian, like they might mummify them. And then this process was called precordia, and was done to prevent decay while funeral arrangements were made, and just to test a little bit if they were worried the Pope was going to reanimate. The tradition started up in the 14th century when it was established that when a Pope passed away, they would be mourned for nine days. Nine days, with suffrage messages being said each day. They borrowed this little schedule from the Byzantines, who observed deaths of their emperors in a very similar manner. Really taken a while off, it took a whole pay period to mourn the loss, and then you dry those tears right up, get back to work. Now, this was all the rage for popes of yesteryear, very trendy, very in fashion, but Pope Pius X in 1914 had a change of heart when he expressly forbade it in his burial and will. He said, don't do any of that weird stuff to me. Those were his exact words, if you can believe it. Now since then, his successors have all agreed and have all done the same. But who's to say? I feel this could be coming back in fashion. Pope Francis, how you feeling? You gotta listen to your heart on this one. Number three, the holy souls of purgatory. Purgatory, in Catholic belief, is kind of like a giant waiting room while the upper management figures out just where exactly they're going to find a good spot that's best for you. Well, that's simplifying it a bit, obviously. The soul is thought to be stranded in purgatory until it atones for its earthly sins, but you can hurry the process up just a little bit if your loved ones back on earth are praying for you. In the back of the Chiesa del Sacro Cure del Suffragio del Piccolo Museo del Purgatorio, or Museum of the Holy Souls in Purgatory, holds a collection of relics that have been singed by the hands of the souls of those trapped in purgatory. These burned handprints are believed to be the souls trying to communicate that their loved ones need to pray harder. I don't know about you, but I would definitely start praying real hard if burned handprints started showing up in my books, but I would be praying for an exorcist, more likely. Now, this is kind of interesting, and I didn't even know this. Purgatory isn't even mentioned directly in the Bible, but the concept of purgatory dates back to the 11th century. This notion that trapped souls needed to be freed came from a story told to the abbot Odillo of Cluny by a monk returning from the Holy Land. He told this story about how this ship had been wrecked, that he'd been cast ashore on a mysterious island, and a hermit who lived on the island related his own story of a chasm from which screams of trapped souls and demonic flames rose and ravaged. He told of how the demons would complain about losing souls when your loved ones would pray for their behalf. So November 2nd was established as All Souls Day. Everybody, all the souls. Where it was believed that prayers by the living could help get all of those trapped dead in purgatory loose. You know, it's kind of like that one episode of The Simpsons where the town comes together to get Bart out of the well. It's a, it's a similar enough concept, you know? They sang a song, you pray, souls get out, Bart gets out, pretty much one and the same. This particular collection of burned relics in particular though, was collected when Victor Jouet, the missionary behind the collection, experienced a fire that burned part of the original suffragio, leaving behind a scorched image of a face that he believed was a trapped soul. Now again, just me personally, but if I saw a face burned into one of my possessions, I would move entirely, call an exorcist, be putting salt circles around my feet for the rest of my life, but I appreciate what he did too. Number two, the Santa Maria della Concezione Crypts. Whew, my Italian 
is not as good as it should be. <laughs> Inside the Santa Maria della Concezion crypts, as many as 4,000 friars lie here. Well, lie is probably the wrong word, as they hang here is probably a more accurate description. As these 4,000 bodies are hanging from the rafters, decorating the space of every inch of the church. Now, it might seem a bit grim or beautiful, depending on your twisted point of view. We're a scary channel, I ain't gonna judge you. There's a certain chic to it. But I wouldn't be surprised if they have to spend a few hundred a month on keeping air fresheners and incense just running all the time there. Now, you might reasonably be wondering, hey, why do they hang bones from the wall like they're throwing a Halloween party and no one went to the store to get actual decorations and they had to make do with what they had? Well, they're not just festive. The practice dates back from the 16th century when the Capuchin friars, not named after the monkey but because of the hoods they wore, left the friary of St. Bonaventure to come live at Santa Maria della Concezione. They were ordered by the Pope's brother at the time to bring the remains of deceased friars with them to their new home so that all the Capuchins could lie together. With a huge amount amount of bodies on their hands, the brothers decided to get a little fun with it and decorate the walls of the crypts with their bones as a way of reminding them that death comes for all of them. Surely there's a slightly easier way to remind you of the ever-present mortality that hangs over us than literally hanging a bunch of pelvises to the buttresses, but what do I know? A plaque in the crypt reads, what you are now, we once were. What we are now, you shall be. Which is, is grim. <laughs> No way around it. The crypt contains a little bit of everything inside you. Crypt of skulls, lovely load of leg bones, and the star of the show is definitely the crypt of pelvises. Oh, make sure you get a photo in there. Make sure you grab a fridge magnet from the pelvis room gift shop. And number one, St. John the Baptist's many heads. They say two heads are better than one, which might be proof of what a great man St. John the Baptist is, because no one can seem to agree how many heads the guy actually had. The saint's head was supposedly brought back from Constantinople in 1206 by the crusader Wallen de Satan, but it seems this happened more than a few times, since three different shrines across the globe all claim to have the original head of St. John the Baptist, and no one's able to clear this up anytime soon. St. John was a forerunner of Jesus Christ, and the New Testament says that John was beheaded by Herod around 28 CE as a punishment for criticizing his recent divorce. Yeesh. Paintings of the beheading depict it on a silver platter, which is a, a nice, Nice way to get a severed head, I think. thats I, I don't know if I ever want a head delivered to me, but if I had to, I would want it on a silver platter. According to the legend, there really was a silver platter his head was delivered on that made its way to Constantinople or Istanbul, but was sold by the Crusaders in order to pay for his travels back. John's head was on display in the Amiens Cathedral up until the French Revolution, where they confiscated all church treasures, and it would eventually return home in 1816, then going all the way back to Rome from Greek monks who brought it to a shrine decorated with beautiful stained glass, one panel depicting the head on a silver platter. You think you wouldn't want to remember that. Well, here's where the trouble comes in. A German museum in Munich also takes great pride in having St. John's head. The Munich Residence Museum contains a bunch of other holy relics, but their most prized is the alleged St. John's head, although no one really knows how it got there. This skull is wrapped in cloth and heavily interred with gems. Now two would be impressive, but St. John's got a crowd worth of heads because he's got three. His last head can be found in Damascus, Syria in the Umad Mosque, one of the oldest and largest mosques in the world. This relic, also not exposed, wrapped in a cloth, and is currently located in a shrine dedicated to the saint. So will the real John the Baptist please stand up? Or do all three of these heads actually really belong to him and he had to be beheaded three times for it to take? You know what, don't answer that. I'm not sure if that's something I really wanna know. Number five, Oliver Plunkett's head. Now in the other two videos, we talked about the head of St. Catherine of Siena and we also talked about St. John the Baptist and how many heads he may or may not have had scattered across the world and I'm not one to break tradition so I thought for part three, I would include a third holy saintly severed head, this time belonging to Oliver Plunkett. Plunkett. A notable difference between the two other severed heads is that this one is probably the most disgusting one we've included on these lists. I know these are all holy relics, but let me just say, out of context, this is absolutely horrifying and looks like it's straight out of a grind host horror movie that you'd find in a, a dirty basket somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver Plunkett, before becoming a head, was an Irish Catholic archbishop who was a victim of the Popish plot. 
Now, if you're not up to date on your Catholicism, that's a whole other video worth of explaining. I don't know much about the Popish plot. I'm not the guy to do that for you. But the short version is that it was a conspiracy falsely alleging that there was a plot against the Protestant king, Charles II. Oliver Plunkett happened to end up on the receiving end of something really bad. Uh, namely, he was executed, which is pretty bad. But they really went out of their way to destroy Oliver Plunkett, his public image, his body. They called his praising of the Roman Catholic Church high treason. And his punishment was a slow and arduous death. He was hung, drawn, and finally quartered. Uh, and just in case there were any odds of him pulling through on a miraculous recovery, as a final effort, they yeeted his head into a fire where it was rescued by a friend of Plunkett. I'd like to think I would do that for my friends. Well, after being recovered, the head was rescued and stored hidden away in a nunnery, eventually brought to Ireland in 1995, where he's now kept on display in the National Shrine to the Saint. He was canonized for his troubles, and he is the first new Irish saint in about 700 years. It's high time for some new blood, I think. So. You can go, you can pay your respects to him, and maybe offer him some skin cream, because uh, that skin's looking a little dry. And if you're looking for more creepy videos on weird relics or all sorts of strange things, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. If there's something scary, the odds are pretty good we've got a video or two on it. And if you haven't already, subscribe, hit that bell for more videos every single day, but do that at the end of this video, okay? We got way more weird Catholic relics coming up for you. Number four, St. Teresa's Hand. Now, if you've watched our other videos on this subject, then no doubt you're already very familiar with the practice of making remnants of saints into relics. Now, something that's directly from a saint is called a first-class relic. That means it's something that came off of their body, you know? Uh, their hair, their fingernails, a vial of their fluids, or in the case of the lovely Saint Teresa, her whole hand. Encased in a beautiful, ornate, golden reliquary with gems all over the knuckles, and the editors are goofing off because that's just a picture of the Infinity Gauntlet from Avengers Endgame. Wait, that, that's the real, that's what it really looks like. Yeah, it seems that Marvel Studios was more than inspired by the incorruptible Saint Teresa's hand when designing the weapon that would give Thanos the power to wipe out half the universe. Throw a comparison pick of them side by side, they're almost indistinguishable. I'm not 100% certain if there's any symbolism or connection there, but I'm sure Saint Teresa would love to know she was involved. She was a huge fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and all the things they do. When Saint Teresa of Avila passed away, the sisters of her convent buried her with the hopes of of keeping her holy body with them. Nine months later, she was exhumed, only to discover that her body was intact. She hadn't decayed at all. That's why they thought she was incorruptible. Now, I'm not sure I totally follow the logic here, but after they discovered her body was incorruptible, they uh, took her hand off and put it into this golden infinity gauntlet thing as a way of inviting people to get closer to God through the saint's body. Now, this might not seem appealing to you, but there's a surprising demand for this relic. Near the end of the Spanish Civil War, General Francisco Franco had the hand removed from the convent and allegedly kept it close by, and if some of the wilder rumors are true, he would keep it by his pillow for good luck. You really gotta hand it to him. He was a devout follower of the faith. Today, you can find the hand in Iglesia de Nuestra Señora de la Merced in Ronda, Andalusia, and you don't even have to rip a stone out of the vision's forehead to get a good look at this gauntlet. Number three, the Veil of Veronica. Now on these lists of holy relics, we've had all sorts of strange things. We've had fingernails, teeth, dried up hands. We got milk coming up later. All things that have come from the body. Well, this next one is no different. It's the Veil of Veronica. And to put it gently, it's a sweat rag that's a few thousand years old. Probably one of the most pungent odors on the planet. Imagine every gym locker room you've ever been in times a thousand. When Jesus carried the cross, bruised and beaten, there was one person among the crowds who saw fit to help him out a little. Veronica wiped Jesus' face with this rag, and miraculously his face transferred onto the rag like it was silly putty on the funny papers. Now as an outsider, I thought this is what the Shroud of Turin was. That was the wrapping used to wrap Jesus after his death, so the thing I'm learning is that Jesus left an imprint of his face on just about any surface he touched. You give him a hug, have his face on the shoulder of your shirt for the rest of your life is a sacred artifact. Now, the Veil of Veronica is hard to nail down hard, concrete facts on. It's never been officially canonized as a relic of the church, and is only alleged to exist. It's claimed to be owned at St. Peter's in Rome, although this particular relic is not on public display anywhere. Probably for the best, 
Honestly don't know if I want to see a 2,000 year old sweat stain, the ones underneath my shirts are bad enough. Now it might sound like I'm being disparaging, referring to this relic multiple times as a sweat rag or a sweat stain, but I would like to offer this. The Latin name for the veil is Sudarium. Sudarium literally translates to sweat cloth, so even the official churchly terminology for this relic acknowledges that it's just a stinky rag that has some sweat on it, but a holy stinky rag that has some sweat on it. Number two, Mother Mary's milk. We're gonna do our best to get through this, I promise. Mother's milk might be my favorite Red Hot Chili Peppers album. It's my favorite character on The Boys, and it might just be one of the oddest relics on a series of odd relics that's all the way to part three. Took a lot of restraint to not put this in the first two, but we're on part three, so here it is now. As incredibly odd as it may sound, the Virgin Mary's milk is considered a relic of the Catholic Church. I, I hope they've been keeping that in the fridge, lest it spoils. Does, does holy milk spoil? Is everything I've said in this video profoundly heretical? There is a church called the Church of Milk Grotto, built outside Bethlehem. The history goes that the Madonna and child had taken refuge in this cave, and while she was feeding, milk spilled outwards and blessed the stone of the cave, turning it completely white. Now the church serves as a popular shrine for women who are struggling with fertility, who hope that the lasting aura and presence of the Virgin Mary will bless them. There's a legend that goes with it. Saint Bernard, the saint, not the big dog that has his tongue hanging out, was devoted to the Mother Mary. And one day he was praying at a statue of the Madonna and he asked it to give him some sign, some proof that she was a mother. I guess the statue has like a odd sense of humor because it sprayed milk onto Saint Bernard uh, depending on the variation of the story, either his eye or in his mouth, I saw a lot of, of really interesting paintings depicting this scene. And editors, I hope you're having so much fun trying to find photos for this one. I am so sorry. Truly, rest in peace, your search history. In the Middle Ages, vials of the milk were sold and transported all over Europe. For what purpose, I could not tell you. These days, the Church of Milk Grotto sells a limestone powder made from the stone walls of the grotto, meant to be dissolved in a drink and consumed. Uh, kind of like crystal light, but it's holy milk. Probably heals all that ails, and it's a good source of calcium, perhaps. And number one, the holy prep use. This is gonna be the one that takes the channel down. You have no idea the restraint it's taken me to, to only be bringing this up now in part three of, of Strange Relics. This is probably the strangest relic of them all. We'll do our best to discuss this with reverence and also somehow figure out how to stay within content guidelines. Editors, best of luck. When Jesus was born, on his eighth day, uh, a small piece of his skin was removed in a traditional ritual performed on Jewish men when they're born. Okay, are you, are you sort of following along with what I'm saying here? This particular part of the body that I can't quite mention that was removed at birth was an immensely holy relic to the Catholic Church called the Holy Prepuce. Now the very bizarre part regarding the history of the Holy Prepuce isn't just that it exists at all, it's how much trouble one bit of skin would cause. You see, the prepuce first pops up in the year 800, when Charlemagne gave it to Pope Leo III on December 25th, making it one of the oddest Christmas gifts ever given in human history. From here, it stayed until 1527. Now, when Rome was sacked, a German soldier stole the prepuce and tried to keep it for himself until it was eventually recovered again and became the centerpiece of the village of Calcutta, where it was seen as the most exciting thing to happen in a while. It was like a celebrity showed up to the village. It was this great, big, important deal. They had a part of the body of the Savior. All manner of miracles are reported to have been the result of the holy prepuce. However, several other churches, villages, priests, all claimed that they had the true holy prepuce, and any other ones you might have heard of out there were false. This problem became rampant, and in the early 1900s, the church wanted to wash their hands of the holy prepuce entirely and outright forbade any discussion of it in church matters. It was actually an excommunicable offense to so much as bring up the prepuce, meaning this video is pure heresy. In 1983, the prepuce was stolen from the church in Calcutta. Where is it now? Where did it go? Absolutely no one knows, no one's fessed up. You know, if you took it, I think now's a good time to just admit you did it, but 
If they're ever looking for a plot line for a third National Treasure movie, I have an absolutely amazing idea for something Nicolas Cage could steal. Number five, The Great Omar. The Great Omar was a one of a kind, tailor made collection of Omar Khayyam's poetry. So if you're looking to score this at your local Barnes and Noble, you might have a bit of trouble. It was commissioned by the owner of a British bookshop whose sole request was that it would be the greatest modern binding in the world. You know, nothing too lofty though. The book itself is made of 5,000 pieces of leather, 1,000 different gemstones, 100 square feet of gold, and some pages too I guess, I think there's poetry inside there. The final book was priced for roughly $150,000 after finishing. So it's a pretty expensive book, but what makes it so cursed? Well, when the Great Omar was purchased, it was bought by an American buyer and had to take a transatlantic trip on a little ship called the Titanic, a boat which as far as I know has never been involved in any sort of historical events of note whatsoever. The Great Omar was never recovered from the wreckage and sank with the ship. Ten weeks after the book kissed the ocean floor, the man who bound it, Francis Sangorski, drowned while on vacation, at only the age of 37. A little suspicious, isn't it? A bookbinder in the 1930s tried to recreate the great Omar, Stanley Bray. He finished the second iteration just in time for World War II to begin. The book was placed in a vault on London's 4th Street, which was one of the first sites to be bombed. I guess they heard about the book. The safe that held the book endured through the Blitz, but the safe's contents and the second great Omar was incinerated and lost to the war. A third version has been crafted and is currently being held in a vault in the British Library. Although given the book's history, I don't feel like I would be too comfortable spending any time around it if I didn't have to. Hey, liking what we do here at Top 5 Scary? Will we always love a little subscribe? Toss one our way.